In his time, two major hypotheses were proposed. That light was waves, or that light was particles. Newton proposed that light was a stream of particles, which he called corpuscles. Emitted by a luminous body such as the sun, they'd travel in straight lines and cast sharp shadows when blocked by an obstacle. The wave theory of light was proposed by a Dutch contemporary of Newton's, Christian Huygens, who cited water waves as his evidence. For example, when two water waves cross, they simply continue in their respective directions, just as two beams of light do. But when two streams of water collide, they're disrupted, which doesn't happen to light. Based on wave theory, Huygens predicted various behaviors. For instance, under certain conditions, waves of light could interact to produce darkness. To understand how that could occur, we need to understand how waves interact. If stones are thrown into a pond, they'll create a series of waves. As the waves travel across the water, they raise and lower the level of the surface, creating ever-widening circles and eventually dissipating. But what exactly is traveling across the surface? Not water, because that is just rising and falling. What is moving across the water is energy. In waves, the level of rise and fall over the flat surface is called amplitude and is one of three measurements used to describe waves. The others are frequency and wavelength. In this diagram of a side view of a wave, we can see how these different measurements are defined. Amplitude is the distance above the baseline at which waves crest. Wavelength is the distance between crests, and the frequency is the number of crests which pass a given point each second. As Huygens proposed, waves that cross aren't disrupted the way streams of water are, but waves have another way of interacting called interference, which affects their power to raise or lower the level of the water. Where the crests of two waves arrive at the same place at the same time, they raise the level of the water twice what each alone would have. The effect is called constructive interference. But if a crest and a trough coincide, they cancel each other's effect. The level of the water will neither go up nor down. This is known as destructive interference. And in 1801, the scientist Thomas Young demonstrated an effect where light waves interfered destructively to produce darkness. By shining a monochromatic light at a screen into which he'd cut two holes, he discovered a pattern of interference predicted by wave theory. In some places, where two wave crests coincided, the screen was very bright. And in others, where the waves canceled each other, it was very dark. Using different colored lights, Young was able to prove that each color has its own range of wavelengths. Violet has the shortest at about 360 billionths of a meter, called nanometers, and red has the longest at about 760 nanometers, with all the other spectral colors falling somewhere in between. More discoveries about light soon followed. In 1849, the French scientist Armand Fizeau succeeded in making an accurate measurement of light speed, finding that it traveled at approximately 300,000 kilometers per second, which seems to be the universe's speed limit. Nothing else can travel as fast. Light from the sun takes only about eight and a half minutes to travel the 93 million miles that separates us. And in 1861, James Clark Maxwell, who was investigating electric and magnetic effects, discovered that an accelerating electric charge would produce a disturbance that traveled at exactly the same speed as light. The conclusion was obvious. Light is a small segment of a much larger class of wave energy known as electromagnetic radiation. 
and there's no limit to how short or long wavelengths can be. Classes of radiation with wavelengths longer than visible light include power transmission, television, radar, infrared or heat. Radar, for example, uses waves that are about one meter long. One wave in electric power transmission could be 10,000 meters long. To communicate with submarines, the United States Navy sometimes uses radio waves that are over 80 kilometers long. In the other direction, waves that are shorter than light, there are ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma, and cosmic rays. But our eyes can respond only to electromagnetic waves between 360 and 760 nanometers, what's known as visually evaluated radiant energy. In fact, that's what makes light light, that our eyes respond to it. Early in the 20th century, Einstein advanced our understanding of light still further when he proposed that while radiation did travel in waves, its energy was contained in packets known as quanta, or, when they refer to visible light, as photons. But how is radiation created? To find the answer, we have to examine the nature of matter at the atomic level. It's quite easy to conceive of the sun radiating energy. We perceive it as light and heat. But actually, everything is radiating energy, including us. At the National Institute of Standards and Technology, scientists measure radiation being emitted by standard lighting sources used for calibration by the lighting industry. But even if they were turned off and cooled down, these filaments would still emit radiation. Dr. Albert Parr is a physicist at the Institute. Anything at a finite temperature uh, is, 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 will, will be emitting photons. They will have some characteristic uh, distribution. It's just that at low temperatures, you no, ordinarily do not see them. They, but it may be out in the, in the radio frequency range or the far infrared where they're emitting at low temperatures. It's only when the temperature of the object gets up in the thousands of degrees that, that give out light in the, in, the, in, the, in the range which our eye can see. The radiation from a tungsten filament, for example, moves out of the infrared into the visible as its temperature rises. But even though we can't see emissions in the infrared, we can build devices that can. Essentially, they're energy detecting machines. In this case, a security camera senses infrared wavelengths outside our range of seeing and presents it on a monitor transposed into our range. The energy is emitted by electrons. Electrons which absorb and emit energy as they continuously orbit the nuclei of atoms at such high speed that they create shells around the core. Every element has a unique structure, a certain number of protons and neutrons in a nucleus surrounded by electrons orbiting in zones. The structure dictates the wavelengths it absorbs and emits, its spectral fingerprint. Although we often depict an atom like a miniature solar system, where we can plot the planet's locations with precision, the reality at the atomic level is really quite different. Right now, our most successful atomic theory is quantum physics. At the New York Hall of Science, they've built a laser drawing of a single atom, magnified one billion times. This is a hydrogen atom, which is made of just two particles, a proton as the nucleus and an orbiting electron. Part of quantum theory says we can never actually track an electron. The best that can be shown is this fuzzy probability cloud, which is brightest where the electron is most likely to be found. Even a billion times magnified, the proton at the center is still too small to be seen. 